Clearly the truth falls on ground where it does not do a bit of good. There were 450 things that I had written down that the Bible tells us or repeats telling us that we're to do if we're true believers. And the simple question I've sometimes asked people is how many do you know? They are certainly in their sexual sin, clearly not people who would be truly seeking, thirsting, hungering after righteousness. What they're really hungering after is what they want. If we look at a truly new Christian, we say, well, hey, it's only been six months. It's only been a couple of years. That person needs to go through a genuine process of discipleship and, and teaching and understanding. And the one problem we have is that a lot of times churches don't really offer that. Uh, and, and so this person is, is left in the nursery, if you will, uh, of the church uh, and never gets a chance to really grow. Uh, I think there are other people who had some kind of an experience and they have opportunities for real discipleship and real growth, uh, but they, they really haven't really been converted. I, I think the scripture verse that really f flows with that idea is the teaching of Jesus in terms of the parable of the sower. Uh, clearly the truth falls on ground where it does not do a bit of good. Uh, and, and, and so we need to go back to that parable over and over again and say, okay, there are people who uh, the seed really did not fall on good ground uh, and the birds came and ate the seed and nothing really happened. Yet at the moment, there may have been this going forward uh, as a altar call invitation is given to accept Christ, but, but nothing happened. It was not a true conversion. And, and of course, when you look at the parable of the sower, what are the influences that keep the seed from really taking root and, and not being choked? Well, the cares of this world, you know, the deceitfulness of riches. The way I read that is simply, you know, the good old American lifestyle is our biggest problem. And I think one of the scriptures that really apply directly to this whole issue of transformation from a, call it a, lifestyle of sexual sin, perhaps not really being converted, but you're an elder in a church, um, is really understanding what Paul says in Philippians, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And, and I, I, some, for some reason, in, in contemporary American Christianity, we have an aversion to that word work. Uh, I don't know if it comes out of our Reformation thought that we are not saved by works, we're saved by faith and faith alone. And I certainly believe we're saved by faith and faith alone. We're not saved by our works. We don't, we don't earn anything in terms of our salvation by who we are, how we perform. And we have to hold on to that clear, sound doctrine. At the same time, we, we can't have an aversion to that word work. Uh, I was going through the New Testament a few years ago, and I started seeing all the things the Scripture tells us that we are to do. And I decided to read each one of the epistles, every one of the epistles. And to do one thing as I read through was to notice where it gave a specific instruction of something we are to do. And write what the instruction was down on a piece of paper and write the scriptural reference. And so I started in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, went through Paul and John and James, Peter, all the epistles. And when I finished, I had all these statements of things we are to do. Uh, put to death what is earthly in you, Colossians 3, 5. That's one thing. Uh, so I counted that as one, not the whole verse, Colossians 3, 5, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality. That's another one. Impurity, that's another one. So when I was counting up the number, I'm looking at maybe a couple of words, a word or a phrase, and 
as I told them all up, and some of them are duplicates, maybe Peter duplicates Paul a bit, but there were 450 things that I had written down that the Bible tells us or repeats telling us that we're to do if we're true believers. And, and the simple question I've sometimes asked people is how many do you know? Uh, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Second Peter chapter one, Paul or Peter, excuse me, says, Peter says, practice these qualities. And he keeps repeating it in just a few verses. Apply these qualities, practice these qualities, do these qualities. You know, and I'm going to keep reminding you of these qualities. Th there is clearly this sense of effort. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Uh, Paul, knowing that these are new Christians, this goes back to the whole concept. What is a Christian and what is the transformation? You're a new Christian. This church was founded by someone other than Paul. He says, I heard of your conversion. I have not ceased to pray for you that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will back to his will, not my will, knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Did you know that God has provided a way of escape from sexual sin for those who have given their lives to his son, Jesus Christ? Yes, there is a journey to freedom, purity, and restoration that works. In his book, Undefiled, Dr. Harry Schomburg lays out a path that will take you beyond 12-step programs, accountability groups, and purity pledges, and into the deeper walk with God that brings freedom. To get your copy of Undefiled, go to www.purepassion.us. Want to keep up on the latest from Pure Passion? We'd like to extend an invitation to you to join our Facebook and Twitter pages. Just add forward slash Pure Passion TV to the Facebook.com or the Twitter.com address and there we are. Read our latest news, inspirational postings, or watch a video about sex trafficking, pornography, or some other form of sexual brokenness. We even post photos taken during our mini taping trips. So come like Pure Passion TV on Facebook and Twitter. There needs to be something dramatically, significantly different in the process of conversion that needs to be lived out in the Christian life. Back to the verse in Philippians. Work out your salvation. There, we got to understand what that is, that working it out. It, it's okay, I am totally saved, I am made righteous, I am imputed righteous by the work of Christ. But the work is not complete. I, I, there's much to be done in terms of transformation that I have to work out. So you got to take those 450 things in the New Testament. This isn't the Old Testament law. This is the New Testament telling us as Christians things that we are to do. And I must work those things out. Why? What's the motivation? Because God is at work. God is at work, of course, in me to will and to do his good pleasure. His good pleasure is to transform me, again, quoting C.S. Lewis, to the highest standard of holiness ever recorded in human history. The work begins now. It will not be completed in this life, C.S. Lewis goes on to say, but God intends us, tends to bring us as far as he can get us before we die. So, so the, the, the Christian life, if, you know, if we've been a Christian for 40 years, there needs to be real progressive transformation and maturity taking place. And when there's not, we need to start asking some hard questions. I think that the, the work that God is doing in us and the work that I am doing, it, sometimes that gets so confusing, but we need to bring those two together, never letting go that God has deposited his spirit in us to do a deep, radical work of transformation. At the same time, there are things that we need to do uh, this is not about kick back and relax. The, the, the Christian life is, is our life. We, we are here to live out the Christian life in, in the world around. We're to be salt. We're to be light. All of, that, all of that applies. That means if we're salt and light, there has to be something that, there has to be something that we exhibit, something that trans, has been transformed that others, others can literally see. And, and so I think it's a, I think it's a tension 
between God is at work, God is de deposited, God has, uh, we, we, are, we, we are partakers of his divine nature. We, we are completely righteous already, and, and yet there is so much that needs to be worked out. So that tension even of being made righteous, now we need to become righteous, it, it sounds like a contradiction. But, but if we're not made righteous, then we're still the enemies of God, we're still under the wrath of God. If we've been made righteous, we are no longer under the wrath of God. And, and, and we are a child of God. At the same time, now we are to walk in a manner worthy of the transformation that has been given to us totally, freely, by the work of Christ and our faith in Christ. Now I need to work that out. At the same time, without God's continuing, continuing work and His grace and the Spirit of God working, I, I can't even make that happen. So there's still this great dependency for the initial conversion, and there's a great dependency on, on what God needs to continue to do. Therefore, I think my part is that, what is that seeking after? What is that passion that says, I, I need to know more of God. I need to be thirsting and hungering for righteousness. And, and, I, and, and as I have worked with thousands of church people, I'll call them, what we call believers from across America, they are certainly in their sexual sin, clearly not people who would be truly seeking, thirsting, hungering after righteousness. What they're really hungering after is what they want, which again goes back to, is it really God's will or is it my will, what I want? And, and if the transformation takes place, then I'm a follower of, of Christ, I'm a disciple of Christ, and I'm going the direction Christ wants me to go, not the direction I want to go. Is masturbation a sin? This is the number one question I receive in purity ministry. And it's the one that should have the easiest answer, right? After all, it's simply a yes or no question. Well, sometimes what appears simple might have a few layers of complexity to it. This is one issue which I believe has a few layers. First, what is masturbation? Masturbation is simply sexual self-stimulation. And from different vantage points, even this definition can be seen differently. For example, from a recovering adult sex addict's viewpoint, masturbation comprises an enormous part of his acting out history, most of which could be clearly seen as outside of God's moral boundaries for sexuality. Therefore, the physical act of masturbation itself can be deemed sinful. However, to an 11-year-old boy who just experienced an erection and touched himself, masturbation might not have attached to it all the immoral connotations that the recovering sex addict has especially if this boy has no sexual history and is completely ignorant of porn, fantasy, or other clearly immoral behaviors. That being said, I believe that ultimately masturbation is not God's best for us when it comes to how we manage our sexuality. So whether or not masturbation in and of itself is a sin, I want to show that I believe it is less than what God intended for our sexualities. Adam and Eve were created purposely by God as sexual beings. And when God brought Eve to Adam after forming her from Adam's rib, he blessed them and commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. I love to remind people that the first command given to human beings was to have sex. But there are some important elements to note regarding this union. First, sex was designed to be between one man and one woman. This was not an act to be committed with an animal or with multiple partners or with the same gender. Second, sex was reserved for expression within marriage. From the very beginning, sex was made for relationship. Therefore, masturbation doesn't fit with that original intent since it is self-sex. Strike one for masturbation being a viable use of one's sexuality. Masturbation is a building block behavior of sexual addiction. And in that addictive development, it almost always is associated with porn or some other lustful mindset. This begins to form strong bonds between immoral thoughts and the act of masturbation. The further one travels down the addictive pathway, the more pronounced the connection between sin and masturbation. 
a type of classical conditioning occurs to one's sexuality in which the lustfulness of sinful sexual thoughts is the primary means by which an individual can become physically aroused. No porn, fantasy, or lust, no arousal. This is not God's design. God would never expect that we should travel a sinful pattern to achieve sexual arousal. That is contrary to who he is on so many levels. Therefore, if one has created such a link between masturbation and lust, you can be sure masturbation is not right. Strike two. Finally, because masturbation is an isolated act, it pulls one away from the type of intimacy God designed for marriage. This is true whether a person is married or single. For the married person, this is obvious. If a husband is engaging in masturbation, he certainly isn't connecting on any level, physically or emotionally, with his wife. But even for the single person, masturbation is still drawing them away from healthy relationships and helping them develop thought patterns of isolation, selfishness, and lust. Strike three for masturbation. So is masturbation a sin? I'm not sure, but I do know it is most often connected to sin. At the very least, masturbation is not God's best, nor is it part of his original design for your sexuality. My advice, just say no. Did you know that God has provided a way of escape from sexual sin for those who have given their lives to his son, Jesus Christ? Yes, there is a journey to freedom, purity, and restoration that works. In his book, Undefiled, Dr. Harry Schomburg lays out a path that will take you beyond 12-step programs, accountability groups, and purity pledges, and into the deeper walk with God that brings freedom. To get your copy of Undefiled, go to www.purepassion.us. If you own an Android device, iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch, we have an awesome gift for you, and it's free. Just go to your favorite app store, do a search for Pure Passion, and download access to over 130 videos, including every episode of Pure Passion TV, plus entire conferences, old TV programs, and more. Listen to files of outstanding lectures on child abuse, homosexuality, and sex addiction. Plus, read and access our websites and our Facebook and Twitter pages. That's the free new app from Pure Passion. The book Undefiled is a book that was written based upon the last 18 years of counseling people who were caught in the bondage of sexual sin and the ideas and the principles and the concepts that we have, we have taught and used in counseling when people come to our intensive counseling program. And if I was to summarize the book in one sentence, uh, and, and the sentence is in the book, to be spiritually mature, we must be sexually mature. To be sexually mature, we must be spiritually mature. And so what Undefiled is basically saying is that we cannot put our spirituality over here and our sexuality over here and in effect live some kind of a split lifestyle. That, that everything that I am sexually needs to relate to everything that I am spiritually, and everything that I am spiritually needs to relate to everything that I am sexual. Now, the obvious, when I say spiritually mature and sexually mature, one would say, well, that means a person who's sexually pure. They're faithful to their wife. They're not looking at pornography. They're not committing adultery. They're not going to a topless bar. Okay, that's certainly sexual maturity. And that's a big part of undefiled, uh, because that's the people that I've worked with uh, exclusively for the last 19 years. However, we're taking it a step further. To be spiritually mature, you have to be sexually mature. To be sexually mature, you have to be spiritually mature. We're also beginning to say sexuality is more than just sexual purity, uh, where, where I have not committed a sexual sin. Sexual maturity must also be looking at the quality of the sexual relationship between a husband and wife who are married. Not only is it sexually pure, but how is that relationship totally sexually fulfilling both for the man and for the woman? All of that is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 7. That's what Paul says. Uh, counseling thousands of people from across America, I find Christians, particularly women, to be extremely dissatisfied with their sexual relations in their marriage. 
And that's not sexual maturity, either on the part of the husband being the lover or on the part of the woman being intimately involved in that relationship and not feeling like a sex object. So you got sexual maturity and spiritual maturity on that level. And then I look at s sexual maturity as 1 Peter 3 for the wife. What does it mean to really have hope in Christ and trust in God in the face of all fear? Is, is, is part of the heart and core of 1 Peter 3. And then for a man, what does it mean to live out first, uh, excuse me, what does it mean to live out Ephesians chapter 5 in, in terms of loving your wife as Christ loved the church and giving yourself up for her? What, is, what does that really mean? In other words, I think spiritual leadership in a man is you're talking about bringing together spirituality and sexuality and in, in demonstrating it in actual male leadership. Uh, most men are wimps. Most men don't have leadership. Most men have very little spiritual leadership at home. Uh, it's, it's like the wife is the spiritual leader. Uh, everybody seems to acknowledge that. It's kind of like that's the default mode for most marriages, at least in the people I've counseled. And so to me, the spiritual maturity and sexual maturity goes all across the board in who we are in developing uh, what I would call a real intimacy, uh, breaking out of that false intimacy uh, and being fully a man, fully a woman, not just being sexually pure. If we, if we focus only on sexual purity, we fall in the trap of looking only at behavior. And the Bible is much more than behavior. It's a transformation of what's on the inside. It's a transformation of the heart that is expressed outwardly, again, not just in sexual purity, but in, in the sense of faithfulness to your spouse but sexual maturity that demonstrates the kind of masculinity and femininity that glorifies God. The behavior uh, is really a problem. But because we focus on that, uh, I think we look for techniques and we look for methods that end up being no more than managing the behavior. And, 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 and that, just, that just concerns me at the deepest level. To me, there, there needs to be a, a real, real emphasis on saying what is the real nature of the problem. And, and so I put a lot of emphasis on Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, put to death what is earthly in you. I don't think there's a verse of scripture, if we look at it carefully, that would be more clear that the problem is inside. Uh, it is what is inside. It's not primarily my family of origin. It, it's not any other explanation that we can come up with. There may be influences of brain chemicals. There may be influences of family of origin uh, and, and trauma that people have gone through. But ultimately, in the end, you have to take all of that and say, the root problem is what is earthly in me and what Paul means by that. Uh, and that that has to be dealt with Otherwise, all we're doing is managing behavior. The old term that's been around for ages is it's just white knuckling. I, I'm just working at managing that behavior. I'm working at my steps. I'm working at my recovery. Uh, and, and fine, you can call it recovery, but are we working at the transformation on the inside in partnership with God who is at work uh, to transform us are we working really with him? Are we working to his purpose? Are we working according to his will? Are we working according to his, the revealed will of God in scripture? Are, are we passionate about seeking first the kingdom of God and not our own kingdom? Is this, is this transforming not just the sexual behavior, but transforming all areas of my life from, from my worldview uh, to what I see as important? You know, uh, do I make my marriage a God? Do I make my career a God? These things need to be addressed and, and looked at if there's real transformation from the inside out. It's kind of like we could stop talking about the behavior and stop thinking about the behavior. Uh, it's a great thing to focus on initially. Guys arrested for soliciting a prostitute. Guys caught with pornography, looking at pornography on the computer. Okay, we can do some immediate intervention in terms of saying, what can we do to help this guy not engage in that behavior? That may be helpful in the initial stages of working with a man or a woman who's caught in the bondage of sexual sin. But in reality, that's just the beginning stages. We have to go beyond and say, how do we help him 
engage with the work of the Spirit of God to transform on the inside, something that I can't do as a counselor, something they cannot do as a counselee, but is really the work of God. And yet at the same time, God has given the church, therefore I think he's given us counselors to help us, and he expects us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And, and that, that mysterious dependency and mystery of working with God in partnership for an inside transformation in which then the behavior is the fruit of that transformation and not where we're putting the emphasis and, and, and all the work. That's what, to me, Undefiled is all about and the message that we've been trying to present over the last 18, 19 years uh, pretty exclusively. Would you like to be free from bondage to sexually immoral behavior? Would you like to have consistent victory over the schemes of the evil one? If indeed you're willing to do whatever it takes to walk in freedom, God has made numerous promises that he will make that happen for you, that there needn't be even a hint of sexual immorality in your life. Dr. Schomburg spoke of the necessity of developing a partnership with God. Assuming you've sincerely repented of your sin and given yourself to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God has provided for you a way of escape from sin. Of course, as fallen human beings, none of us will perfectly utilize that way of escape every time, but the ability to walk away from sin will always be present to a true believer who is living in abject dependence on God to keep him from falling. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that the weapons that a believer fights with have divine power to demolish strongholds and that God enables us to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Oh yes, the temptations will come, but they must bow to the knee of Christ if it is our belief and will that they do so. You see, the power over sin is there. It is the commitment to use the power that is usually lacking. And it is the failure to develop an intimate relationship with God that creates the atmosphere in which temptation can give birth to sin. We are still holding on to our own lives rather than giving them over completely to the Lordship of Christ. In some ways, we still doubt the goodness of God and refuse to trust Him completely. And in so many cases, we simply love the sin more than we love our Lord because we don't really know Him. Once these matters have been rectified, then we're left with a God of incomparably great power who will destroy the devil's work in our lives if we will only believe. What a great God we serve, a God who will do for us everything that he asks of us, if we'll only believe. So let's press into God for his transformation program rather than continuing to settle for the world's maintenance program. And keep watching us every week. I'm Jonathan Darty for Pure Passion.